Hey everyone, uh, this is a lecture for a narrative of the captivity and restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson, uh, written of course by Mary Rowlandson in 1682 or published in 1682. Um, this lecture will cover the intro, the first remove, the second remove, the third, and the twelfth removes. Um, stay tuned for part two uh, coming soon. Go ahead and get started. And I want to begin with just a little historical backdrop to uh, provide some context. Um, in 1675, we have the uh, we have King Philip's War in colonial America. Um, this is involving the Wampanoag leader Medicom, um, aka also known as King Philip, um, who organized a series of attacks on New England settlements to regain sovereignty over their territory and stop further colonial expansion. So as the colony was growing, uh, more colonials were pushing west into the Appalachians um, and the natives were trying to end that expansion. Um, so we have the war in 1675. By 1676, uh, 3,000 natives were dead, including Medicom, whose wife and children were sold into slavery along with other prisoners of war. Um, on the other end, 600 colonials were dead and uh, 1,200 houses had been burned. These new settlements that were popping up um, had been burned to the ground. Um, as a result of the war, um, native sovereignty or control or freedom power um, in New England had greatly diminished. Um, however, the most famous account of these attacks uh, comes from Mary Rowlandson. Um, she is the wife of a of, uh, the minister of Lancaster, Massachusetts. Um, her relationship with him, I think, heavily influences the text. Um, the story she tells covers the attack on Lancaster in 1676 and the 11 weeks she spends in captivity um, as a prisoner of war. Um, um, after her release, members of the clergy prompted Rowlandson to write about her captivity so that the colony could find meaning in her experience. Uh, we talked about this before, one of our key terms, hermeneutics, um, is once again kind of on display here, as the hope would be that uh, other colonial members could read her work and um, find meaning in it, perhaps in her, her faith, her steadfastness, um, her discipline while a prisoner of war. Um, other things to uh, consider here include uh, kind of the hope that um, this story would uh, connect individuals um, or, or, or would be able to connect her individual experience to a group identity. Um, again, as we kind of talked about with Winthrop, there's the idea of uh, nation building here or just kind of uh, solidifying that um, um, concrete understanding of the church and what it should be, what good behavior looks like. Um, other themes you see on display here, of course, are adventure, tragedy, um, exemplary piety, um, a divine plan, which we'll talk about with some of the quotes, um, grief and acceptance. Um, we'll move forward and look at some key terms. Um, apologia um, is a defense of one's actions. And you could read Mary Rowlandson's story, um, her narrative as a defense of uh, why she did what she did. If you note, um, apologia looks a lot like the word apology. Um, it does not mean apology. It is not, I'm sorry. It is a defense, an explanation, a justification of our actions. And apologia is, uh, I'm sorry, but, and then uh, kind of listing those reasons for why you did what you did. Um, I think you can see that in her text as you read. It's an apologia, a defense of um, what happened and, and why it happened and how she behaved during it. Um, the doctrine of afflictions um, is also an important key term in this text. It, it is the Puritan belief um, that God tests the elect, um, thus tragedies, suffering, pain, obstacles. These are all signs that God is testing an individual's faith. Um, moreover, he only tests the elect, thus affliction is a good sign for your soul. So we kind of get this takeaway message that pain can be good. And perhaps this idea continues to resonate in our culture, in our society today, 
this idea that uh, if you are going through a tough time, it is, you know, only um, it's because God believes that you can make it through, that he, he knows that you have the faith and the, um, you know, the virtues to uh, pass through this test. Um, so this idea, I think, continues um, in our culture, um, though I, I'm not sure if it's a healthy tradition. Um, nonetheless, uh, you, can, you can take that and, and um, let it marinate and, and see what you think about that idea of the doctrine of afflictions, the idea that uh, the, an, an affliction, pain, tragedy, suffering, an obstacle is a sign um, that you are the elect, that you are part of those going to heaven, that you are uh, worthy of such, of such pain because you have the uh, natural virtue within you and the faith in God to make it through. Um, bibliomancy is our last key term. That is the act of turning to a random page in the Bible and interpreting the passage as God's message for the moment in your life. You see Rollinson do this a few times in the text. Um, just note that it's slightly different than hermeneutics. It is not just interpreting um, a text for meaning, but actually flipping to a random page in the Bible, finding it, um, and seeing that as, as some sort of act of divine intervention that God is trying to uh, send a message to your life in this very moment. And so turning to that random page, picking out a verse, and then applying it to your current situation. Um, the quotes I wanted to um, review for this part of the lecture, for this part of the reading, um, are these three. Um, the first one comes from Rowlandson's sister during the attack, I believe this is in the intro or the first remove. Um, and, and Lord, let me die with them. This is her older sister speaking, which was no sooner said, Mary Rowlandson reports, um, but she was struck with a bullet and fell down dead over the threshold. I hope she is reaping the fruit, she continues, of her good labors, being faithful to the service of God in her place. Um, a, a, a complex quote, and so... Uh, Let's try to unravel it a little bit. Mary Rowlandson's sister um, is aware that her, her children have died, have been killed by this attack. Um, and so she calls up to God, you know, and asks, uh, you know, to die with him. Immediately, she is uh, granted that wish. And so the idea that there's some sort of divine intervention, um, at least according to the narrative that we have, um, is, is presented here. Um, just to go back for a second as I, as I kind of think about this, um, that influence of the clergy and Mary Rowlandson, um, her husband, I think uh, kind of determines how this story is told um, in terms of style. And, um, and again, the message that they are trying to uh, deliver to their flock, to other people in the community. Um, so what is the message here? Lord, let me die with them, which was no sooner said, but she was struck with a bullet. Now, we cannot verify that that actually happened, that she said it, and then she was, you know, struck with a bullet and, and found dead. Um, but that is the story we were told. So there's the idea here that, that, you know, her prayer was answered, a strange prayer, but perhaps she was um, saved from the horror that befell Mary Rowlandson herself as she would be taken in captivity um, by the natives who attacked. Um, we kind of have the idea here that uh, she earned this, that um, she earned this quick and, uh, I guess, easy death. Um, I hope she is reaping the fruit of her good labors, being faithful to the service of God in her place. Um, so it is as if she were one of the elect that she uh, um, took on this great affliction, death, um, as a sign of her virtue, of her worthiness, of her elect. At least that's how it's presented in the text, that she was saved, um, that this is, you know, a justification for her death. It is because of her good labor, of, you know, because of her faith. Um, that she was able to die with her sons. This is how it's justified anyways. And perhaps you get the sense of that apologia here, an apologia for God, why God would take a good soul because he is saving her from further um, horror, I guess you could say. So that's kind of an interesting way to interpret it. Um, we'll move on to quote two. 
Um, but now the next morning, I must turn my back upon the town and travel with them into the vast and desolate wilderness. I knew not whither. Um, I wanted to take a moment and talk about this quote because I think it kind of uh, reminds me of Winthrop and um, especially his final, um, the final part of his sermon about a city upon a hill. It is here where she seems to, uh, you know, turn back upon the town, upon the city upon a hill. I believe she describes Lancaster as a city upon a hill. If you uh, read closely in that first intro um, about the attack, um, it's, and so now she is turning her back upon the town, upon society, upon Christian values, upon uh, civilization itself, and then moving toward the wilderness. Um, at this point in American uh, culture, and certainly American literature, the wilderness is presented as a place um, of lawlessness, um, where there are no communities, there is no civilization, it is a place that is desolate, um, it's a place um, without principle or moral. Um, so she is going into this wilderness, it is in the wilderness where we are tested. And if we think about the exodus from Winthrop, from Moses, it is uh, in the wilderness where we are challenged by God to have faith, to make it through that tough time. Um, and so this is where she is going. Um, it is almost like she is, you know, dealing falsely with her God. If we think about that language that Winthrop uses, um, and now she must, uh, you know, deal with not, um, you know, salvation, but curses. She must be, in, and so she is challenged in this way. Again, it's flipped. It's flipped because of the doctrine of afflictions. And you'll see evidence of this where she feels like it is uh, a good thing to be challenged this way. Um, and it is a sign of her, of her, um, you know, faith in God um, that she uh, has to endure this challenge. Yet, nonetheless, you kind of see, um, you know, some of the themes here turning her back on society, going into the wilderness. I always want to remind you to kind of uh, consider how nature is presented, um, how the natural world is presented in these texts, and, and try to just uh, mark the evolution. Um, of that as we as we get deeper into the semester. So again, here wilderness, a place where we are tested, a place without law. The final quote we can look at today, I cannot but take notice of the wonderful mercy of God to me and those afflictions and sending me a Bible. Uh, one of the Indians that came from the Medfield fight had brought some plunder, came to me and asked me if I would have a Bible. Um, he had got on in his basket. Um, I know the language is a little complicated there, but you see what's happening here. Um, in the first sentence, she is giving all the credit to God, again, to his divine intervention, to his mercy um, in this tough time by sending her a Bible. So that is kind of the message that uh, they are hoping that you, you um, gain from reading this part of, of the narrative, that uh, if you are steadfast in your devotion, if you, uh, you know, remain true to God in tough times, then he will take care of you. He will, he will show you mercy. But the second sentence kind of tells a different story. Um, one of the Indians came from the Medfield fight, had brought some plunder, including the Bible, um, and he gave it to her. So, who deserves the credit here, God or the Indian for showing mercy um, and giving her a Bible to read, knowing that she would benefit from it? Um, it's just a question here of cause and effect and how you want to read it. Is it all divine intervention? Was this all part of a bigger plan? This Indian should uh, scoop up a Bible and um, you know, during one of these attacks, one of these fights, and then by chance, deliver it to Mary Rowlandson? Um, or is, is that story part of God's plan? Or is the uh, Native American himself showing some mercy to Mary Rowlandson uh, in her plight? Um, there are multiple examples of this. You start to look for them where on one hand, she gives credit to God and then tells the story that seems to paint a different picture um, that seems to suggest that uh, 
those who have captured her are fairly compassionate and um, to kind of help her along, help carry her load, I think is another example. And she kind of gives credit to God for, um, you know, the strength that she is able to carry her load. And, and then um, another way to look at it is that the Indians are actually carrying things for her. So um, a few quotes to examine, um, of course, for homework, you're asked to uh, cite your own quotation and interpret it. And I look forward to uh, reading that soon. We'll come back for uh, part two um, very soon and we'll wrap up uh, the narrative and, captiv and captivity of Mary Rowlandson then. All right, thank you so much, bye.